I would like to welcome our guest, Jennifer Edwards, Rural Health Manager and Deputy Director from the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health. Jennifer, thank you for joining us today, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Kiona. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. All right, I am going to try to share my screen here. Okay. Kiona, is there a way to take down the polling question? There we go. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jen Edwards, and I am the Rural Health Systems Manager and Deputy Director for the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health. Uh, I'd also like to take this time to recognize Lynette Fetzer, who is our SHIP coordinator, who is also on this call as well. Um, and I might, might ask for help from her later, but we will see how it goes. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is what I'm going to go over today. I'm going to give you a, a short overview of the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the overview of the global budget structure and the implementation of the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model here in Pennsylvania. I am also going to go over some slides that are specifically from um, the Department of Health and the uh, Pennsylvania Rural Health Model Implementation Team. So they are actually uh, their slides. And then uh, we are going to discuss some strategies to reduce potentially avoidable utilization. Um, and then our Pennsylvania SHIP activities for FY19 and FY20, our challenges, successes, and best practices. And then some of the specific examples and uh, progress and outcomes to date for our SHIP activities. So the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health was formed in 1991 and was a partnership between the federal government, Penn State of Pennsylvania, and Penn State University. Uh, I have only been here since the summer of 2018. Uh, Lisa Davis is our director and she has been here since a very long time, since uh, not too far in right after that in the 90s. Um, we are administratively located in the Department of Health Policy and Administration within the College of Health and Human Development. And we provide expertise in the areas of rural health, agricultural health and safety, oral health and community and economic development. Our office has seven employees, including one flex coordinator, which is myself, and one ship coordinator, who is Lynette Fetzer. And Lynette and I work as a team to support the 15 CAUs and the 27 ship hospitals. Lynette is also our quality improvement coordinator for the flex program, and she manages the MVQIP program for Pennsylvania. So the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model is an alternative payment model, and it was designed to address financial challenges faced by rural hospitals in Pennsylvania by transitioning them from fee for service to global budgets. Um, this provides a stable monthly payments from participating payers, and it allows hospitals to focus on delivering value-based care and transforming the care they deliver to better meet the community's health needs. The Pennsylvania Rural Health Model was designed in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Innovation, CMMI, and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Um, while the model is currently uh, sort of in transition, it is still um, administered out of the Department of Health. The Pennsylvania legislator, le legislature passed legislation, which was PA Senate Bill 314, signed into law on November 27, 2019, to create the Rural Health Redesign Center. Um, 
we ha they had 180 days to create the Pennsylvania, the Rural Health Redesign Center. Um, and so the date, the target date was May 27th, 2020, which they did meet. Um, it is an independent authority established through legislative action with a governing board. And that board has been established and it has been meeting. There's equal representation on the agency board as established by legislation between payers and providers along with other appointed rural health experts. The Pennsylvania rural health model is the first model focused entirely on rural hospitals. The model was implemented on January 1st, 2019 with five participating hospitals, three of which were critical access hospitals and the other two small rural hospitals. There were also five payers participating in year one. Currently for year two, there are 13 participating hospitals, five CAUSE and eight PPS hospitals. Okay, before we actually get into the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, I wanted to just give you um, some key differences between the Maryland model and the PA Rural Health Model. Um, the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model is focused on retaining access to care and jobs versus cost containment. Ultimately, reducing costs is a goal of the program, but that is not the the um, the absolute focus. It is retaining access to care in the local community and um, making sure that we can maintain jobs in those communities as well. There is no global rate setting function in Pennsylvania. Uh, the underlying negotiated rates between payers and providers remain intact. So um, whatever those contracts that the hospitals have with their payers, those remain the same, whereas um, those were all negotiated uh, to be one rate for in Maryland. Additionally, there is no all claims database in Pennsylvania. Uh, there, are, there are other ways that they are looking to um, get the data to calculate global budgets for all the payers and to determine um, quality outcomes. And probably the, the most important difference is that this model in Pennsylvania is not mandatory. Hospitals do not have to participate in this model. It is 100% voluntary. So this map is a map of Pennsylvania and it displays the rural hospitals across the state. The dots represent 2018 uh, margins of the hospitals. Uh, this data was extracted from the Pennsylvania Cost Containment Council. And as you can see, there's more red and yellow than green on this map. Um, the goal of the model is to prevent rural hospitals from closing and this keeps the access to high quality care local and prevents an economic crisis in the community if the hospital were to close. It's important to note that the global budget for each hospital is determined by utilizing a look back period of one to three years, whichever is best for the hospital, the hospital selects uh, which they which they want to use. So essentially, the model recaptures net payment revenue that may have decreased, may likely have decreased each year. And then they take that annualized revenue and divide it up into 12 monthly payments. So the hospital has um, the same payment per month from each payer. So there, it, it's a stabilization. So before we get into this, an example um, for year one hospitals is um, each payer would either base their payment on 
for year one, it was FY18 or the FY16 through 18 average. Um, just to, to help understand how the global budgets are, are calculated. So if we look at this chart, the model provides protection from some of the most challenging issues facing rural healthcare leaders by minimizing several of the risks. So if you look on the fee for service side, you have unpredictable revenue due to volume fluctuations, but on the model side, there is predictable revenue stream uh, that's independent of current volumes. On the fee for service side, if providers resign or there are recruitment challenges on the fee for service, you are losing that revenue immediately. You have an, uh, an immediate impact to that. Because the hospital is utilizing global payments based on prior years, um, they're protected from that uh, immediate impact of the provider departure and it provides stability until they can re their recruitment efforts uh, are successful. Competition with tertiary care centers for volume is under the fee for service, but under the model, competition's no longer a driver. Uh, the model enables service line analysis and optimization, which aids in bringing appropriate utilization back into the community. So they really um, do a very in-depth analysis to determine what makes the most sense for your service lines. And if there is not a need in the community for that service line, then those things are reconsidered. Investments in population health uh, under fee for service, it's the right thing for the community, but the wrong thing for the bottom line. Uh, for the, under the model, it eliminates that concern because concern you are paid to keep people healthy in the community. Regulatory barriers that prohibit innovation is another fee for service risk, but within the model, opportunities opportunities exist to apply for waivers and regulations. And these include potential waivers to national and state policies and regulations that may present barriers to an organization's transformation plan. The two core tenants that make the model different from fee-for-service is the um, monthly stabilized payments. The hospital receives equal monthly payments from each participating payer. And then the hospital's incentivized to invest in community health to retain the revenue. And they do this by creating a transformation plan based on three main goals that the hospital selects that we'll get into a little more in depth. So the Global budget stabilizes hospital revenue compared to fee-for-service, um, which is imperative for rural communities where population is declining. Um, so the hospital and fee-for-service is paid for the number of resources consumed by the community, the healthcare resources. So if the community is getting smaller, so is the revenue. But as we all know, we've also seen that regardless of whether the community is getting smaller, inpatient days continue to shrink. Um, on the global budget side, the hospitals paid the same as um, same amount of money as the historical net patient revenue, regardless of how many resources are consumed by the community. So you are protected um, from from those issues. To the extent the hospital can reduce unnecessary unnecessary utilization they will keep historic revenue. So the model focuses on two areas for potentially avoidable utilization. The first of that is um, patients that seek care in the emergency department that may not, that, that could have potentially been seen in a primary care office and it wasn't necessarily um, an emergency. These are, this is one of the areas of potentially avoidable utilization. Another area is the hospital uh, inpatients that are readmitted within 30 days 
um, that is also something that could potentially be avoided. So if you, by retaining the revenue associated with reduced potentially avoidable utilization, the hospital has the opportunity to invest in services that promote community wellness. And that is where we talked about previously the transformation plan. Um, hospitals can select the areas that they wanna focus on. Many of the hospitals that are participating in um, the, the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model have selected areas such as care coordination, um, you know, a, a focus on, on care management, uh, which includes chronic patients. Um, some of them have selected specific populations of patients like um, CHF patients or COPD patients or even patients with diabetes. Um, many of them are looking at social determinants of health and implementing a way uh, within their hospital to be able to track the, those things so that they can get a better, better handle on what are the main problems in their communities. Um, and we'll talk about a few more as we go on. So, the bottom line is hospitals succeed in the model to the extent that they help their community uh, become healthier. And um, these are key factors for improving the health of rural Pennsylvanians. There are a few other benefits for participating hospitals in the model. Um, collaboration and the sharing of best practices is very much a focus. So all hospitals participating in the model have to agree to share best practices with the other hospitals participating. And um, it is a very collaborative environment. There are currently six um, working groups that the hospitals are participating in that we'll get into a little bit more in detail. Um, but this is an example of ways that they are collaborating. Uh, also, the implementation team for the model, they provide robust technical support and to the infrastructure and enable impactful community health outcomes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about strategies that reduce potentially avoidable uh, utilization in the emergency department and readmissions. We talked about a few of these already. Um, many of the hospitals have made a plan to implement or expand care coordination and focusing on chronic conditions. Um, but some are also focusing on some other areas such as substance use disorder and mental health. Um, community paramedicine is another way for some of the hospitals to be able to get folks out into the community and um, be able to have more home type visits. So some of the hospitals that actually have EMS integrated inside the hospital have already started implementing things like this. Um, others are trying to work with their local EMS departments. As we all know, there is tremendous amount of pressure on EMS with loss of revenue and um, personnel problems, uh, that decreasing pool of um, people that, that are able to volunteer, um, especially in rural communities where they cannot afford to have as many paid positions. So that is a tricky area, um, but th there has been some um, movement made on trying to utilize some of the larger community paramedicine programs in Pennsylvania to create a model and, and really look to see if, um, if we can open up some opportunities in rural communities for community paramedicine. Uh, integrating primary care is another strategy to reduce potentially avoidable utilization. And many of the hospitals who have not um, had previously provider-based rural health clinics are looking to um, 
get involved in, and purchase or um, acquire uh, provider-based rural health clinics. Um, some have already, some that have already, already have provider-based rural health clinics have expanded. Uh, we talked a little bit about social determinants of health, which is critically important um, to looking at everything outside of just the physical health of each individual, looking at potentially physical environment, air and water quality, housing and transit, um, social and economic factors like education, employment, income, family and social support is a huge thing. Uh, many of the communities have um, some of their elderly face a lot of um, isolation if they don't have family members around, which really impacts health. Access to care, quality of care, um, and then health barriers like tobacco use and diet and exercise, alcohol and drug use. We talked a little about Bit about substance use disorder and mental health. We did have one of the hospitals who is actually a critical access hospital that applied for um, one of the HRSA grants last year and um, was successful in getting a um, MAT program implemented at their facility and uh, our office as well as the um, implementation team for the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model um, very much uh, worked with them to help them um, be successful with this. Uh, oral health is another example. Many of the rural health clinics are trying to uh, bring in oral health and we actually have someone on our team Kelly Braun, who uh, works, to works to very much help our rural health clinics implement um, oral health programs and um, assist them with starting or improving their rural health clinics. She is, a, she's certified in, um, she has her certification in rural health clinics. Telemedicine is another huge um, example and this we have seen grow even larger uh, because of the COVID-19 situation and the waivers that, the federal waivers that have come through CMS and also legislation that has passed to make telemedicine uh, much more accessible. And then there's also regional strategies and operational efficiencies that um, hospitals focus on uh, to make efforts to reduce their potentially avoidable utilization. So we're going to get into our SHIP program here. Pennsylvania has 27 SHIP eligible hospitals. The hospitals that are highlighted in green are the year one hospitals. The bolded hospitals are the year two hospitals and there are two um, like gray hospitals. Those hospitals actually um, did not participate in FY19 or FY20 because they just became eligible um, due to the COVID ship. So um, these are new hospitals to the program for Pennsylvania. So for FY19 and FY20, um, Pennsylvania ship activities have been um, primarily value-based purchasing activities, and they are the focus for the Pennsylvania SHIP hospitals. Um, in FY19, we had 19 hospitals that participated in value-based purchasing activities. And in, in FY20, which um, has just started, we have 21 hospitals that selected uh, value-based purchasing activities. So these activities include quality reporting, HCAPS collection or training, QI training, provider-based clinic quality measures training, and alternative payment model training activities. A fewer hospitals have selected um, ACO and um, accountable care organization and payment bundling activities. 
So six hospitals in FY19 and four in FY20 selected ACO activities to include disease registry, community paramedicine, provider order entry training, pharmacy services implementation, and social determinants of health. And then um, three hospitals in FY19 and two in FY20 selected um, payment bundling activities. These include ICD-10, S-10 cost reporting training, and price transparency training. So our challenges. Um, the, the first challenge is um, out of the 27 ship hospitals, we only have for year one, four of the hospitals were SHIP hospitals that were participating in the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model. So it is, as the years have gone on, the, it, that has increased. So in year two, eight of the 27 SHIP participating hospitals are um, participating in the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model. So this is a problem in a couple of ways. Um, we cannot focus 100% on the hospitals that are participating in the model. Um, we do emphasize um, the value-based uh, transitioning from uh, volume to value and focusing on value-based care. Um, but a lot of our hospitals are um, very focused on quality and very much focused on um, the two priorities of the ship, which is the ICD-10 and the HCAPs, and many of them um, do select the HCAPs. So timing. Uh, for year one hospitals, they did not actually have to commit to the model until December 31st, 2018. So when we were selecting, when the hospitals had to select their ship projects for FY19 that happened in November, December timeframe. And so many of them were not absolutely positive that their boards of directors were going to approve participation in the model. And in reality, some of them did not. Some of the hospital leadership that was very, very interested in participating in the model, the board of directors did not ultimately um, approve their participation in the model. So it was a little bit easier for year two hospitals um, because they had to commit prior to August 2019. So we did have a few more hospitals that um, were interested in picking ship um, activities that more closely aligned with their transformation plans that they had selected to work on. Um, year three hospitals have been extended due to COVID-19. So COVID-19 has obviously been um, a major impact, not only to the uh, FY19 activities that the hospitals were working on, but also um, just to the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model um, hospitals had to short, sort of drop everything that they were working on to focus on implementing their emergency management plans and really figuring out um, how they were going to uh, deal with the pandemic. So lack of cohort participation in Pennsylvania, we have pretty much tried every year when we um, put together our plan for um, each, each ship. And um, we, last year, we offered the hospitals to participate in a price transparency cohort, which only one of them agreed to participate in. So ultimately, if you have one, we, we didn't have a cohort. So um, years before that, there have been some projects that we've been successful at getting some of them, but part of the reason that cohorts are difficult in Pennsylvania is because it is a very, very competitive healthcare market and we have um, many different 
uh, health systems here and they are very competitive. So um, the two biggest competitors are probably uh, UPMC and Geisinger, which we have one um, hospital from Geisinger and then um, we have multiple hospitals that are ship hospitals um, that are under UPMC. Um, but it's challenging to get the health systems to agree to participate with the other health systems um, for cohorts. We think that because of the Pennsylvania rural health model requirement for collaboration and sharing of best practices, that this may help us to um, tear down some barriers that there has have been in the state um, to date. And we hope that uh, we will start to see some more progress in this area. And then I've already mentioned COVID-19, which has been a uh, difficult um, situation for, for all of us here in, in this year. But it did pause the year three recruiting efforts for the model. Um, you know, the more hospitals that are participating, the easier it is it will be for us to be able to get more collaborative projects that um, multiple hospitals will be able to participate in. And it did pause a majority of the ship activities so hospitals could focus on the pandemic. Um, the one positive about uh, many of our hospitals that select HCAPs um, is that that is something that they usually pay for early on in the beginning of the year. So not many of our projects were impacted because um, the hospitals did that uh, earlier on in the year. So our successes and best practices. 100% um, of our SHIP hospitals participated in both FY19 and FY20, which is fantastic. We, um, we really work hard to try to make things as simple for the hospitals as possible um, so that they feel like that, that um, the workload is not too much in agreeing to participate. Um, the number of hospitals that participated in care coordination and telemedicine activities increased slightly from FY18 through FY20. And then, as I mentioned, 76% of the Pennsylvania hospitals in FY19 and 84% in FY20 selected HCAPs or quality reporting activities um, to focus on quality. And for us, um, this year that was a success because they were able to complete their projects and um, it also is reflective in their quality reporting scores. Um, Best practices. So we talked a little bit earlier about the PA, uh, Pennsylvania Rural Health Model Working Groups. There are six of them. And um, those working groups include regional strategies, which um, we have several hospitals participating in the model that are fairly close to one another. So that makes sense. We have two that are in Susquehanna County and um, those two have collaborated um, a little bit in the past, but because they are both participating in Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, they are finding more and more ways to collaborate. So that has been very successful. Um, I think almost every single hospital that is participating in the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model is focused on care coordination um, because frankly, you just can't get a handle on your chronic patients and um, you know patients you, you really cannot reduce your potentially avoidable utilization unless you focus on this. Um, most of our hospitals have been very successful at um, finding ways to collect social determinants of health data. So this is something that they started doing um, all different time frames, but um, I think at this point they're starting to have enough data that they can really see uh, where they have issues in social determinants of health. But all of them can agree 
that um, transportation in rural Pennsylvania is very difficult. There is not um, really public transportation uh, to speak of. And uh, I actually am um, the transportation working group um, coordinator. So I um, host those calls and work uh, closely with the, um, the personnel from the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model Implementation Group. And uh, some of the things that we're focused on is um, looking at the legislation in the state, looking at the current policies and procedures and seeing is there, is there anything that, that we could potentially help to influence. Um, community paramedicine is a big topic and there's a lot of interest in that, but um, there's a lot of challenges there as well. So um, COVID actually did put a little bit of a, um, you know, pause in all the working groups as well. So um, all the working groups will start, uh, start up again in July. But um, our hospital and health system association in Pennsylvania leads the substance use disorder working group. And then we also have an operational efficiency working group as well. Um, COVID related, uh, we're excited that COVID has significantly increased the use of telemedicine. And we really feel like, um, you know, we've heard that, that they're, they are looking to make some of these uh, waivers and some of these changes permanent. So we are, you know, excited and looking forward to hearing uh, what those are. And um, again, the majority of ship activities uh, were paused across the country for many of the hospitals so they could focus on the pandemic. Um, but I, I think that that, um, I think that really does draw attention to the importance of their emergency management plan. And, um, you know, you have to look at the good that, that can come out of the, come out of the difficulties. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some progress and outcome examples that we have that um, we were very proud of. Um, so UPMC Wellsboro, which used to be um, Soldiers and Sailors uh, Hospital, they have, they implemented this last year, they implemented a transition of care project, which they actually won um, one of our local awards here in Pennsylvania um, that, that we um, put out of our office. Um, they built comprehensive discharge binders. Uh, they also enhanced the patient boards within their um, hospital room. This was really to help family members and uh, the patients understand, you know, the, the level of activity that they were allowed to do, um, their diet. So, you know, family members that were visiting, they could see and, and sort of help the patients um, focus in on these things. There was a daily rounding with multi, multidisciplinary teams, including providers. And this was to reinforce patient education about discharge expectations and follow-up care. And they also made, um, three-day follow-up appointments before discharge. They also, um, if the patient was going to have home health, everything was scheduled prior to them leaving. So they actually knew, the patient knew who their home health aide was and when they were going to be coming. They also pre-ordered all DME supplies to ensure that all of this was set up for the patient so there was no confusion and also arranged for transportation for patient follow-up appointments if the patient was going to have difficulty getting, getting to those appointments. So this was a very successful project. Um, it improved the patient outcomes, reduced readmissions, and also improved patient satisfaction. Uh, Lecom Corey Memorial Hospital also did a similar project. Um, 
it, they didn't focus as much on the comprehensive binders. The binders that Wellsboro created was actually something that the patients would bring into their follow-up appointments with their primary care provider. Um, Corey focused more on um, care coordination as far as uh, chronic, uh, and they were focused on CHF patients. Um, telehealth, UPM Mun UPMC Muncie was actually recognized for their telehealth innovation by the National uh, Rural Health Resource Center. Um, and it, uh, their project reflected innovation required to address population health through expansion of technology. They provided uh, telehealth services in telestroke, um, infectious disease, endocrinology, podiatry, wound care, pharmacy, and neurology, and there's several other specialties that they're uh, continuing to um, work on. I didn't have Titusville on um, our examples, but because we had um, such a focus on QI initiatives, Titusville actually focused on uh, quality improvement initiatives in the emergency department. Um, they initially focused on the door to dock metric from the time the patient entered the emergency room until they had a diagnostic evaluation by the provider. They had started with a 46 minute um, uh, time frame and they average and they got it down to 20 minutes. They implemented a new patient triage process employee communication board in the emergency department, uh, quarterly physician report cards, imaging and lab process changes so that they could perform tests uh, sooner, and then there would be a quicker turnaround time on results. And um, they also did electronic patient satisfaction surveys before the patient even left the emergency room. Um, a big thing that really it has also helped with not just quality improvement, but also um, uh, care coordination was they did follow-up calls uh, for all post-ED. They did the follow-up calls after they left the, the ED several days afterwards to see had the patient followed up with their primary care provider and they wanted to make sure that there was no questions or no issues with any of the medication or instructions that they had. So this is, these are some of the, um, the examples and, and progresses that, that we have for, for our um, ship engagements that are focused more on um, some of the global budgeting um, priorities. We are very hopeful that um, as the, the hospitals continue to advance in their uh, transformation plans that they will engage more and more. And we did have two hospitals last year that had originally selected projects and then after they were certain that they were going to be involved with the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model, they actually changed their projects so that they could work on something. Um, UPMC Kane was actually one of them uh, when they changed their initiative from, um, from HCAPS over to telehealth and they implemented, um, they're still, they are um, not as far along as UPMC Muncie. They purchased the equipment and they are, um, uh, they were in the midst of implementing their telehealth as, as this started. So they are um, still making progress, but we're hopeful that um, we can be um, positive and be very, um, aggressive with helping the hospitals continue to work on value-based uh, initiatives. And then this is our contact information if you have any questions, but if anybody has any questions now, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you for that great presentation, Jen. Uh, I just want to, like she had opened it up for questions, I want to open it up for questions if anybody has anything that they would either like comment for their information on or specific questions regarding the presentation.
As we close up today, um, I would like to pull up our second round of polling questions. I think you'll know this is Sally before um, you start polling. I just wondered, Jen, it sounded like um, you had indicated that cohorts weren't, um, hadn't been real feasible in, in Pennsylvania. So were the activities selected? Did they tend to do then their own trainings or were you finding they were using funding for software um, equipment types of things rather than training since they were doing it individually? I think um, there was a combination of both. I think that um, many of the health systems, they will work like there is a ship coordinator that coordinates all the ship projects uh, within that health system. At least that's the way it is for two of them. So they tend to select the same project. But um, for example, UPMC, um, they pulled their money so that they could do HCAPs, um, but instead of um, just regular written uh, surveys that they sent out, they did telephone surveys. And by pulling their funds, they could get a better uh, rate with the provider that they, the consulting group that they went through. But in a case like that, there wasn't, you know, the, the surveys are individual to the hospital. So they really weren't, you know, sharing best practices or doing, like the hospitals were still primarily working independently for these projects. Um, there's, you know, some of the independent hospitals that, that did select projects like, um, some of them purchased some quality improvement software. Um, you know, we, we did have someone that focused on uh, community paramedicine. It's just, it's just been difficult for us to, um, you know, we've, we've brought up a lot of different kinds of projects. And um, at the end of the day, when they are asked to select a project, they do not want to, to do cohorts. So it's just been a challenge and we've been, um, you know, Lisa and our team have, have 